Coming up on today's show, I'll be covering the Trump administration trying to save us all from the tyranny of efficient light bulbs. Also, author Tim Wise joins me to talk about big ag and its effect on climate change. And in our Good, Bad, Ugly segment, I'll be exposing both the good of what Ireland is doing to help the climate and the very, very ugly of killers in the Mojave Desert not yet found. Plus, our new geeky science is inspired by my indoor cat, Keddy, getting loose outdoors and what he was up to. Our science take is about how Trump has swooped in to save us from the tyranny of efficient light bulbs. Seriously, this is the 85th environmental protection that this guy has rolled back. Essentially saying, eh, we're fine to destroy civilization for profits. What Donald Trump is doing is undoing George Bush's bipartisan light bulb standards. I'm not talking about a Bush's. He wants to take us, I mean, this is like saying, we're going to do away with cars. We're going to bring back buggy whips and horses and carriages. This is, I mean, literally, light bulbs, incandescent bulbs are a 19th century technology before cars. Bush's rule back in 2007 led to widespread use of light emitting diodes, LED bulbs, which are five times more efficient than regular light bulbs. Obama added to that and said, add that to specialty bulbs, like the three-way bulbs, fluorescent bulbs, the bulbs that are shaped like little candles and things like that. They can all be made out of LEDs and, and they look great. They work well and they save you know, all this energy. The National Resource Defense Council says Trump's actions will continue us paying energy bills of $14 billion a year and, and thus keep 25 power plants running full time for no need. Fossil fuel companies and billionaires, you know, the Cokes and whatnot, love this. And so do the light bulb manufacturers because LEDs last 10 years and these kind of, uh, you know, incandescent bulbs burn out after a year or so. So they sell more bulbs, they sell more fossil fuels. But, you know, what does that do to us? Well, consumers pay an extra $14 billion. The fossil fuel lobby gets uh, all this money the big light bulb companies are making extra money because they're selling more light bulbs. Nobody is advocating for the consumers. This is part of a bigger rollback, by the way. It's not just light bulbs. It includes car efficiency, home efficiency standards, corporate methane and CO2 standards with everything from drilling and gas fracking all the way up to the, to, well, like the car emission standards. The bottom line here, Donald Trump and big, big fossil fuel and in this case, big light bulbs, are aggressively and intentionally poisoning our atmosphere simply to enhance the profits of big fossil fuels and the companies that make incandescent, you know, 19th century light bulbs. Fortunately, environmental groups are suing to save the earth. Let's wish them well. Today is Timothy Wise. He is a uh, an author. His uh, most recent book, Eating Tomorrow, from New Press. He's the director of the Land and Food Rights Program at the Small Planet Institute in Cambridge. Smallplanet.org is the website. You can tweet him at Timothy A. Wise. Uh, ranchers and farmers are setting fire to parts of the Amazon to clear land for cattle and soybeans. It kind of illustrates the dire warnings in the UN's report on climate change and land. And uh, in this book, Eating Tomorrow, uh, Timothy Wise talks about how current agricultural pro processes around the world are basically destroying our, our planet. Timothy, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, what are the UN and IPCC reports saying about the, the rise of world hunger in our food systems? Well, what, what the, the most recent report on climate change and land um, focuses on is um, the contributions of our food systems and of agriculture generally to um, the climate crisis. Um, and that, that involves everything from deforestation, like we're seeing in Brazil, from the pressures and the incentives to grow more corn, soybeans, um, and cattle. Um, and and then the the contributions to greenhouse gases from um, from agricultural practices that are fossil fuel intensive. Uh, chemical fertilizers are made from fossil f fuels, um, and that are um, undermining the the natural resource base on which future food production depends. 
So why in the, in the face of this is the U.S. actually expanding and exporting chemical intensive agriculture? And what's the difference between um, companies in the U.S.? And I, know, I realize Monsanto has been sold to a German company, Bayer, but um, companies based in the U.S., shall we say, or companies operating out of the U.S., their uh, corporate evangelism essentially for this. And what role is the U.S. federal government playing in promoting this kind of agriculture? Well, the federal government for a long time, along with almost all other um, international institutions from the U.N. agencies on down, has been uh, promoting the, the quote-unquote modernization of agriculture. And the modernization of agriculture is really a recipe to, do, um, to turn the world into a replica of what the United States has done, eliminating almost all small farms, um, industrializing the, the agricultural system, moving people off the land with uh, machinery and, um, and other technologies. And it's just inappropriate technology for the rest of the world um, because most of the world is fed by small-scale farmers. Small, uh, 70% of the food consumed in developing countries where, farm, where hunger is still quite prevalent are, um, uh, is provided by people in those countries, and the majority of that is provided by small-scale farmers. So, you know, I, I, I see that some of these uh, fossil fuel companies, or these companies that are making these chemicals out of fossil fuels, are claiming that it is, quote, climate smart, using fossil fuel-derived fertilizers and things, and, and, you know, pesticides and herbicides. Is that, you know, tell me about that. Well, that's one of the that's one of the smoke screens that's uh, that's come up. What people call greenwashing. Um, it, it, what they're saying it isn't completely false. It's that um, their practices are so damaging now that you can tweak those practices to make them a little less damaging. So, climate smart is anything that makes it a little less damaging. Um, uh, an example would be. Um, uh, using no-till agriculture, which means you don't plow every year. And that means you have weed problems. So uh, Monsanto has the answer for that. Um, it's called Roundup. And it means you plant, you can plant vast swaths of, I mean, thousands of acres at a time of um, industrial soybeans and douse them with uh, Roundup. And you're going to get credit in the, in the system for being climate smart because you're not tilling the land to remove weeds in between or, or in between your harvests. That's amazing. It's, there's nothing climate smart about it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, tell me about the role of hybrid, commercially developed hybrid and particularly GMO seeds what, and, and this kind of monoculture. You, you talked about thousands of acres of soybeans. Um, what impact does monoculture like that have and how is that impact um, either mitigated or, or made worse by the use of GMO products? Um, I mean, the, the big issue with hybrid corn for developing country farmers in particular is that they have to buy it every year. Farmers, most farmers in a place like Africa, in a continent like Af Africa, save their seeds from year to year and replant them. Um, and the strategy of the seed companies and the governments and the Gates Foundation um, and groups like the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa um, have put in place all of these incentives to try to pressure farmers to give up their seed savings, give up their traditional practices of, of using seeds, and buy commercial seeds every year. And, of course, those commercial seeds come as a technology package with commercial fertilizers, and that vastly expands the market for uh, Monsanto, the fertilizer companies, and the rest. And um, herbicides, the too. Addition of, and herbicides, too. And the addition of GMOs, uh, makes it far more complicated. Um, most of Africa still rejects GMOs, particularly for food crops. So that's a good thing, but that's one of the one of the the last frontiers that the seed and chemical companies want to conquer. And that's why they're so intent on opening up Africa to the seed giants and the chemical giants. Amazing. And the GMOs. To what extent do trade agreements like NAFTA uh, impact all this? Well, NAFTA um, and other trade agreements are all about empowering multinational firms to trade internationally and to operate internationally. That includes um, exporting their seeds, but it also includes exporting their crops. So 
developing countries by and large, I mean, developed countries by and large, with the exception of maybe Brazil and Argentina, are, are, are the main providers of basic agricultural commodities like corn and soybeans. And trade agreements open up developing countries to those imports. Those imports come in particularly cheap um, because we overproduce them and we subsidize them. And that's called agricultural dumping when a when a product goes is exported at below what it costs to produce it. We've been doing that for years and years, um, with a few exceptional years when prices were high. Isn't this how we wiped out all does, these Mexican subsistence farmers, for example? Exactly. The I mean a study that we did um of the first nine years of NAFTA showed that U.S. corn exports to Mexico went up more than 400%. They were going into Mexico at a 20% below what it cost to produce the corn. Wow. And that pr prices that, that Mexican farmers could get for their corn went down 66%. Yeah, which is which, just a shocking blow. Yeah, which just devastated a, the, the Mexican agricultural sector, the, the small farming it did. sector. It, no, and that's uh, it's it, it's uh, it created an absolute rural crisis. The majority of people in rural areas live in poverty. Yeah, yeah. So, what do we do about this? I mean, is it the ag biz lobby, the the chemical lobby? I know here in the United States, our Supreme Court has said that basically, you know, these corporations are persons, and that they have under the First Amendment the right to own their own politicians, and 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 frankly, to say anything to to influence the public. Uh, I don't believe that they have that corporations have that much power in a lot of European countries. Um, how do we push back against this, and and to what extent is this just you know corporate lobbying and and capture of the political uh, sphere? No, I mean I saw it everywhere I went for this book. I, I studied the United States, India, Mexico, and and three countries in Southern Africa, and. Um, everywhere I went, I saw how that agribusiness firms had largely hijacked the policy process to tailor policies in their favor. That's everything from a former Monsanto official actually drafting Malawi's seed policy um, and doing so in a way that would have made it, um, uh, initially at least in his first draft, illegal for farmers to save, exchange, and sell their seeds. So what do they have to do? They have to buy from Monsanto, which controls 50% of the commercial corn seed market. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely is about getting reigning in the, the agribusiness giants. And certainly in the United States, that's in, that involves getting money out of politics as best we can. Um, that's a difficult task, uh, but, but people don't realize how much agribusiness is the agribusiness lobby and and it's a mistake to call it the farm lobby because it's really not lobbying for farmers it's lobbying for corporations the, they spend more than the defense industry does in washington on lobbying it's the good the bad and the very very exaucurately ugly the good ireland Ireland will plant 440 million trees by 2040 as part of its efforts to combat the climate crisis, the Irish Times reported Saturday. The announcement comes about two months after a study found planting more than 500 billion trees was the, quote, most effective climate change solution around. Ireland, of course, recognizes that this is just one of many parts of a good climate change strategy. Good on you, Ireland. The bad broadcast news. Media Matters documents that of 216 network TV segments on the Hurricane Dorian, only one mentioned climate change. Wow. No mention at all on ABC and NBC. CBS's only mention was their morning show segment on Prince Harry's plane travel. Dorian got stronger faster and ended up bigger than any hurricane to ever hit the Bahamas because of warmer ocean currents from climate change. Scientists agree on this, but it's shameful that our TV networks won't mention it. Come on, media. Get some scientists on and start speaking out on issues where literally the future of human, human civilization is at stake. And the very, very ugly, the killer of 42 wild bureau, burrows. The Bureau of Man, Land Management and Animal Rights Groups are offering a $60,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of whoever is massacring the wild burrows of the Mojave Desert. They've been protected since 1971 by the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, so the person or people behind these killings could face years in prison. It appears that these are just joy killings, people using the burrows as target practice, although it may also have to do with ranchers wanting to use public lands. Keep an eye on this story.
This geeky science caught my eye because Louise and I were sitting in the living room when we heard a lot of yelling by a nearby crow outside. So much so that Louise went outside to see what all the commotion was about. To her astonishment, she saw our outdoor cat, Ketty, dashing under the bushes with a crow following him and yelling at him. Which brings me to this story. Apparently, researchers have discovered that gray squirrels eavesdrop on the chatter of nearby songbirds to discover if there are predators nearby. Casual bird chatter tells them no imminent threat. But when the researchers played bird sounds warning of predators nearby, the squirrels showed an increase in predator vigilance, behaviors like freezing, looking up, or fleeing. When the researchers played sounds of casual bird chatter, the squirrels returned to foraging or playing. So cues for safety appear to be as important as the cues to flee. You know, nature is always smarter than we think. Which takes me back to Ketty, who evaded being caught by Louise for several minutes as he chased a duck down the beach and back into the water. Our cat won't be getting out any time soon, again, and all of us need to keep our cats indoors because they kill so many birds and other wildlife. According to scientists at NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, July 2019 was the hottest month on record for our planet. Average global temperature in July was 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average, making it the hottest July in the 140 year long record. The previous hottest July on record was on 2016. Nine of the 10 hottest Julys have occurred since 2005, with the last five years ranking as the five hottest. This is not surprising, there's also record low sea ice. Average Arctic sea ice set a record low for July, so it's running 19.5% below average, surpassing the previous historic low of July 2012.